This, the series we're in, hi, here I am. Uh, we're in a series called Unchained, and the series is all about the Bible. And so there's that music, and when you know the power of the Bible, and then you hear powerful music that just moves you, I'm like, I'm so inspired. That seems so simple, but inside of me, I'm so inspired because God is so good, and he's so big. And I want every single person to know how big and how good God is. Amen. Amen. Maybe you don't believe that. That's okay. Uh, good morning. I, I do want to say hello to our Facebook audience, whoever's watching live. Good morning. Hello. Good to have you with us. So glad to be doing Sunday morning with you as well. So my name's Tiffany. Uh, my husband, Elliot, and I have the great honor of pastoring this group of people here called Lifeline Church. Uh, and I'm so glad I already said that because I did the announcements to be doing Sunday morning with you. I really think it's great to be here with you all. And I believe really, truly, I, there's a car up here. I don't know where this car came from. You know what? When I was walking into the church, I saw the car outside on the ground, and I thought for sure my two-year-old son would see it and be like, car, and he almost stepped on it. He didn't even see it, and now it's on the table, and I'm going to fidget with it, so I'm going to put it on the ground. Whew, church is fun. I feel like church should be fun, and you should be yourself, and that is good. So we're in a, this is, we're in a series called Unchained. This is the third week in our series about the Bible, uh, and our theme verse for the, the, this is why it's called Unchained, it comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, and it says this, it's Paul saying, and he's, he says, because I preach this good news, the gospel, the Bible, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal, but the word of God cannot be chained. So it's called Unchained, and I love that statement so much. I mean, think about it. The word of God cannot be chained. Um, that's like, it's, it's, there's nothing that can stop the word of God from coming to pass. Abs it cannot be chained. There's nothing that can stop it. There's nothing strong enough or powerful enough or dark enough to keep God's word from coming to pass. If God said it, God will do it. And there's absolutely nothing that will get in the way or hinder it or will stop it. And he will keep moving it forward against every obstacle and against every insurmountable obstacle, anything. God keeps moving his word forward. And I, and I bring that up to say, because sometimes in our lives, we feel like the word of God is not coming to pass. We feel like the word of God is chained. But but there should be, if you know Jesus and, and, and you believe the Bible, there should be this kind of discomfort within you where the word of God is like, it's like he's almost moving on this rock. Like, just budge. Like, he's going to keep moving um, it forward. It cannot be bound up. It cannot be imprisoned. Paul was in prison when he was writing the word, and still the word got out. There was nothing that could stop the word of God from getting to God's people. He will find a way to make it happen. Um, and so as I was thinking about, though, this, the, the message this morning, I was thinking that maybe there's people hearing the message or even here this morning uh, where you, you probably love God. I believe that that's true. Or you're at least somewhat interested in God, which is why you're listening to a sermon or at a church, because that'd be weird <laughs> if you didn't, you know, I mean, come on. Um, but it's possible that you don't have any passion for God. Like, yeah, he's interesting. I'm interested in him. But maybe there's no, there's no passion. There's no drive. There's, there's very little pull to find out who God is. Um, and we often refer to the Bible. So this is about the word of God. And the Bible, I have two. Because one of these has a concordance and the other one doesn't. And I need them both. Anyway, uh, the Bible. Sometimes the Bible is called God's word. But God's word is so much more than just the Bible. And Andy Stanley does this, he's a pastor, he does this really great sermon on the Bible, and he talks about the fact that God's word existed before the Bible. I mean, how do you think we got the Bible? Because he talked about it before the Bible was written, and the Bible has been written, it's been canonized, I mean, it's been the same for thousands of years, and yet God still speaks. To people. And so God's word is contained in the Bible, but it is so much more than the Bible. God continues to speak to us today through his word. This is still inspired. He still uses it. But he also speaks to people. He speaks to you in your, in your daily life. He'll, he'll speak to you in dreams. He can do that. He can speak to you in daydreams. He, he can interrupt your thoughts. He can interrupt a moment because the word of God still speaks. God is still alive. If you remember, uh, I think it was our first week of this series, and Pastor Elliot talked out of the the book of John. And you remember it says, in the beginning was God, and in the beginning with the word was yada yada. The word was in the beginning with God. And then it says the word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. And then we found out that, that the word was Jesus. So Jesus, the word, is one and the same. Then he came and became flesh. And then he lived on the earth. And then he died. He was actually, you know, killed, crucified, hung on a cross. And then God raised him from the dead. And now he still lives. And so the word of God came and dwelt among us. And this is the word of God. And the word of God still speaks. And the word of God spoke in the past. I don't know about you, but when I start to think about that, I get a little like... I cannot put all those pieces together. And this is funny. I should never have done this. I decided, because this is sort of an apologetics message, which is trying to, you make a case for the Bible, which can be so daunting because, like, it doesn't make any sense. God doesn't make any sense sometimes. He's so big and he's so powerful. And you know what? People come up with really good arguments against God. I'll give them that. I read this thing on the internet, bad idea. And he was, it was some negative comment. And this is what he said. He, it was an, I don't know what he was, but he came to the Bible and he was reading it. And here's the deal. Christians, we talk, you know, we, we love God, we love Jesus, and we have a bunch of rules, feels like. You know, we're not supposed to judge people. Uh, we're not supposed to lie. We're not supposed to have sex outside of marriage. Uh, we're not supposed to, like, marry our brother or sister or do weird things like that. Um, and so this guy, he, kn- he knows the rules of Christianity, I guess. And he read the Bible. But if you read the, the Old Testament from like, uh, well, most of it, Genesis through whatever, uh, we'll go to Joshua. Genesis through Joshua. Did you know that all those things exist in the Bible? There is incest. There is um, lying and cheating and stealing. And so he was making this comment like, if you're not supposed to do all that stuff, why is it contained in the Bible? And today we're going to talk about the fact that the Bible is useful. The Bible is useful. Here's the deal. Those things did exist. But, but God wrote the word and inspired the word and inspired people to write down the word and to write down history and to write down what happened through bad decisions and poor choices and God coming in to bring love and salvation even in the midst of our dysfunction and trying to get it right but continuing to do it wrong. He recorded history so we can come back and see it and we can look at it and it's useful. And so yes, when you come to the Bible, sometimes there are things that don't make any sense and things that God told us not to do, he actually told people to record in history. And so sometimes when you... When you Uh, If you're new to Christianity, you're new to Jesus, just read the New Testament for now. (laughs) Uh, The Old Testament is great, but, and I I actually do read the Old Testament and come up with those questions, and I've said this before, but if you don't ever come to the Word and read it and begin to ask questions to find out that there's confusing things, then you're not going to hear the voice of God because you're not asking God questions. But if you begin to ask God questions, you can be sure that he's going to answer because he said, for those who seek me with all of their heart, I will be found by them. And so when those things begin to stir in your heart and they don't make any sense and you want to understand God and you come to him and you begin to ask questions, he's going to answer you because you're seeking him. And when you seek him, he will be found by you. Uh, And so I encourage that. Um, Good. So the word of God is contained in the Bible, but the word of God is not restricted to the Bible. He still speaks today. And this is, a, this is cool. The, the, the Bible says that God's word is living and active, which again doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's paper. How is it living and active? And it says it's able to divide between soul and spirit, between bone and marrow. And that simply means this. When we come to the word of God, when we come in contact with the Bible or the spoken word of God, if we're paying attention, it's like there's this highlighter inside of us, and we're going to get to it, I'm going to expose it, where we can see that my soul feels tired and hopeless, but when I come to the word of God, there's a desperate pull to believe what God is saying is true. There's a pull inside of me to to find hope and to find joy and to find love. So if you are paying attention, I don't know if you guys even pick up a paper Bible. I suggest that you do. You can even do it on your app. In the morning time when I'm busy, I pull it up on my app, but sometimes I just, I like I like this one. Um, but if you're paying attention to your physiological, your, your bodily responses when you come to the word of God, it's almost like, maybe you've never experienced this, but I do. I come to the, to the word and my brain is really trying to find some way to believe what I just read or what I just heard. I'm, pro- I'm trying to find some way to process it or to implement it or to see if it's true in my life. So if you've never done that, come to the word and when you read it, pay attention to what your body and what your mind is doing uh, when you come to the word. 
Um, and I, this, is, this is the thing. So I made this big deal about the word of God not being chained. There's nothing in the world that can stop it. But here's the deal. If um, your life has been so bad and you've experienced, here's the, what happens in our life. Something happens and we pick up a lie. Um, this just happened. I did a really cool thing the other day. Um, when I was really small, um, I was at a church sleepover party. And there were supposed to, two girls who were supposed to be my friend, friends. And I was walking into the room, and they were, I was like six. I was, they were talking about me, and then when I came in to sit with them, they told me that they didn't want me to play with them. They said, you can't, you can't play with us. We don't want to play with you. I was like, mm, okay. So I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I was a little bit tim, timid of a kid. So I, and it's a church summer party. The whole church is there. It's like, maybe it was just girls. I can't even remember. But we went and had ice cream. So I had ice cream all by myself. And then I remember later that night, I got heartburn in my chest, which I'm six years old. Who gets heartburn at six? But I did. And then I, I told my mom I wanted to go home, which never happens. I don't want to leave places. I want to stay. I want to you know, miss anything. So I went home. And the Lord brought me back to that memory. And he said, Tiffany, you picked up a lie there. You picked up a lie that said you're not wanted. Whew. And I was like, okay, okay that's true. He, but, and so I picked up a lie about myself, number one, that I wasn't wanted. But then he said, you picked up a lie about me. And number two, that's that I don't want you. And so when you come to the scripture and you read the word of God, you process your life through your experiences. And if you picked up a lie through your experiences about God, then it's really hard to come to God and believe that what he says is true and to believe that his word is unchained his word is unchained it cannot be bound nothing in all of creation will stop his word from coming to pass but if you don't believe that it's true it will not come to pass in your life it will come to pass all around you and you can see god at work all around you but you are the only and that seems that seems wild and that seems crazy but he's given us free will he's given us a choice and so we can choose to hold off the things that God wants to do in our life by disbelief. He talks about that in Hebrews chapter 4, the word. So today we are going to talk about uh, the word of God being useful. And um, Okay, so when I was a kid, um, <laughs> I, I knew Jesus, and I, and I loved God. And I believe that Christians loved the Bible for some reason, and they thought that it was useful because they would read it. And so as a kid, how many of you guys have ever dealt with something called anxiety? Anxiety? Anxious? Feeling anxious? Overwhelmed? Like, <gasps> the whole world is caving in around me? Okay, so as a kid, I was really, I was, for some, I'm still, I still am a nervous person. You know what? It's probably because I picked up a lie that says I wasn't wanted. So when I walk into a room, I feel like I'm going to be rejected. I'm like pre-rejected before I walk into the room. And so I deal with anxiety. You know what? God can break that in your life. As the lie has been exposed, I can know, hey, I don't need to feel nervous walking into a room because my God wants me. And you know what? When I, when I exchanged that lie, this is what God said to me. God says, I want you. I saw you. I chose you. Before the world was even created, I chose you and appointed you to go and to proclaim the gospel. Woohoo! Good things, good things. But we're talking about why the, why the Bible is useful. Okay, so anxiety. When I was a kid, if you have a paper Bible, but now we have Google, so you can do the same thing with Google. I, do it now. Um, I knew that I wanted to, to read the Bible. I wanted it to be useful. I wanted to apply it to my life, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Because uh, when you open the Bible, let's say you're going through something and you're feeling anxious. If you open the Bible to just anywhere, chances are it's not going to solve your problem. Because you're not going to read about anything that applies to you. It's a story about someone else, and they're not dealing with anxiety. And so how in the world? You know what you're going to find is correction. You're going to come to the Bible hoping for something good, and you're going to feel judged. If, I mean, come on. Have you ever done that? Maybe not. You come to the Bible hoping to find something good, and instead you find something else that tells you you're wrong. You did something wrong. And I'm like, that's not what I wanted. I'm already feeling anxious. Don't add to my anxiety by correcting me. Okay. But here's the deal. There's something called a concordance in the back of your Bible. And when I was a kid, I knew that that existed. And so I was feeling anxious, and I thought, okay, I'm going to look up the word anxiety or anxious. And so I found it. So I'm showing you. you find, so if you're feeling something in your life, you're feeling anxiety, you're feeling stress, you're feeling pressure, 
whatever. You find the word or something similar to the word, and you go and, and, and you look it up. So I'm looking for anxiety, anxiety. It says anxious, anxiety, anxiety, anxieties. And then you look them all up, which most of them are not helpful. They won't apply to your situation. And I'll explain that in a minute. Like I, I, pulled up, I pulled up one, and it says, I don't want you to be anxious about anything. A married man is anxious about, and I'm like, I'm not a married man. <laughs> that doesn't apply to me. Uh, so you have to go, and you kind of have to look up all of them to find out if there's anything that applies to you. But there was one, anxieties. It says, casting all your, it has an A, that means anxiety, casting all your anxiety on him. I'm like, that's that seems interesting, maybe applicable. So I'll go turn to it. It said 1 Peter 5, 7. Okay, so I find in my Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. This is what it says. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Well, that's interesting because I can do something with my anxiety. I can cast it on a person. Well, who's the person? Let's back up a verse. It says in verse 6, humble yourselves. Okay, um, humble myself. Before, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And so as a small, as a younger person, when I, when I would come and deal with anxiety, I'd go to this verse and I would be reminded that my God does care for me. And there's something I can do with my anxiety. I can cast it on him. I can come to God and say, God, I'm feeling anxious. Will you take this from me? Will you lift me up? Will you exalt me? Will you guard and protect my heart? Now, that's not always helpful. You won't always be able to come to the concordance and find something useful or helpful for your life. But sometimes you will. And there's nothing wrong with coming to the concordance and saying, is there a quick fix for a situation in my life? Because that's what that is. That's a quick fix. You're looking for a quick, a microwave solution, you know, to probably a deeper problem. And I began to learn scripture that way. Truly, I did. I would look things up, and I would begin to understand that my God does care for me. And I would memorize scripture. So the next time I felt anxious, I didn't have to come to the concordance. I would remember the scripture. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And the word of God began to become useful in my life. But as I grew up, as I started growing, that didn't always seem to work anymore. It was like there was more, there's got to be more than just quick fix going to the concordance for something. And so as I began to read the scripture, what I would do is I would still go to that same spot. I'd go to the concordance, I'd find that verse. But instead of just reading that verse, I'd read the whole chapter. I'd read all of chapter five. And then instead of just reading all of chapter five, I'd read all of first Peter. And what I began to see is that God paints pictures. God uses people's life, people's stories to tell a story that, that is applicable to me that I can see. And so he was writing to, to Peter. It was Peter, and he was writing. So he's dealt with anxiety before. I could see in all these things that he's encouraging the church. Um, and God paints pictures. God uses words. God tells stories. And probably maybe you have never taken a test or anything, but I'd say more than I don't know percentages. I'm not even going to say that. Most of us are probably visual learners, though. And so God, God knows that. And so he uses stories. But in order to get the whole story, you have to read the whole book, which is a little bit time-consuming. I mean, who's going to sit down and actually read a whole chapter of the Bible today? I ain't got time for that. But you should. You should make time for that. Because when you, when, you, when you read the Word of God and you see the stories and the pictures that he's painting, you can remember that. That's something you can remember, and it becomes useful um, in your life. Okay, so Hebrews 4.12, that's that scripture. It says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, the word of God is both, I already said this, is both the Bible, the inspired word of God, and it's the word that he still speaks today. And I, I mentioned this, God's word is useful, but it requires belief on your part. If you do not believe that God's word is true, then you will see others strong in their faith. You will see others unwavering in hard circumstances. You will see others able to pray to God and see their prayer answered. But you will be watching it happen and not having it take place in your own life because there is a level of belief. You must 
believe in order to receive what God has for you. And so I want you, I really do want you to fall in love with the Bible. I want you to fall in love with the Word of God. I want you to be not intimidated to come and to pick it up and to read it and to understand, I may not know it all, and I may not get it, and it may not make any sense, and I sure as heck couldn't teach it to anybody, but I really want you to just have a love where you're drawn to, and you want to come to the Word of God to pick it up and to begin to understand it. Um, we're going to keep going, but I just I want to take a minute and pray for a minute. Can we do that? Father, I thank you for your word, both the inspired word that you continue to speak through the power of your spirit that ministers to our hearts, that highlights those lies, that exposes the darkness inside of us in order that we can walk into the light. And I thank you for the written word, the Bible, which is written centuries ago, but still is in existence. Father, and you use this this, this paper, this word of God, the thing we find on the interweb, Lord, it's to expose our hearts and to bring us from darkness into light. Lord, and I ask, Father, that you would begin to stir in us a desire to come to your word. That we would long to either wake up earlier, to stay up later, to take our Bible off the dusty bookshelf at whatever time of day it is, to read the word and to, and to know the word. And not just to check it off a list because that's what Christians do, but to sit down with a chapter or with a verse and say, Father, speak to me here. I want to understand this. Lord, give us that desire to be people who are hungry to learn about you, to seek you with all of our hearts and to find you. In the name of Jesus, may your spirit go before me, before these words, and illuminate things in our hearts. Lord, draw us into your presence. This is all for nothing if we don't encounter you, if we don't love you, if we don't meet with you. You are our lifeblood. You are life. You are love. You are healing. You are everything that we need, and we can find that in your word. It's written in your word. When we come to your word, there is hope. There is healing. There is power. There is freedom. And so, Jesus, speak that over your people this morning. Whew, amen. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is what Timothy says the Bible is useful for. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, All scripture, which is the word of God, the Bible, is inspired by God and is, here it is, useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what's right. God uses scripture to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So the word of God has actual practical application in everyday life for every single person. Here we go. The word of God is only useful to you if you are open to being prepared and equipped to do his work his way. If you come to the Bible not open to transformation or correction, it's not useful. <laughs> because like I said, you'll go looking for a quick fix and you'll find correction because that's what the Bible does. It says that. It will teach us what is right. It will highlight what is wrong. It will correct us when we are wrong. And it will instead teach us to do what's right. So if you just you need to know that. And then here's another thing. Uh, God uses scripture to prepare his people for his work. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says this, the message of the cross, which is basically the whole Bible, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Remember when I said earlier, when we try and wrap our mind around God, it's really hard. And so we encounter people in life who they know are a Christian, they know we're a believer, and they want to ah, interrogate us a little bit, like, why this, why this, yada, yada, and we can't explain it. It doesn't make any sense, and it will never make any sense to someone who does not believe in God. Scripture says that. It is foolishness, a complete and utter foolishness. It will not make sense. But to us who believe it is the power of God, there is this strange driving force for us who believe that, that pulls us in and draws us closer, even though we cannot understand it, even though we cannot explain it all, the Holy Spirit of God draws us in because it is foolishness to those who are perishing, those who do not believe. But if you do believe, he is going to draw you in. He is going to bring you to understanding, but you're not going to have a full understanding until we get to heaven. Nobody will ever, okay? Um, so just know that. If you approach the Bible with a stubborn heart, <laughs> it's not useful. 
okay? Uh, if you're just going to get angry and mad, and then you'll get mad at God because he's always telling you what to do. I mean, I, I know you know that. Okay, Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 21 through 32. Let's actually look at some scriptures, shall we? Turn to your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, um, verse 32. I marked it in mine with my little thingy bobber. Ephesians 4, ch- uh, chapter, ver- chapter 4, verse 21. And we're, I'm going to read the whole thing, and then I'm going to go back and move through it really quickly. And it says this. Um, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Okay, so what I want to do is just break this down because that all seems pretty like, duh. It's kind of common sense. I feel like, I feel like, maybe not though. Uh, So we're going to break it down. Verse 21 says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Now, there's another scripture in the Bible. It's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Perhaps you've heard it. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This verse that we just read in Ephesians gives a little bit of clarity to the other verse. It says, "Because if anyone is in new Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And I think sometimes we feel like the new hasn't come. And so we still feel like an old person. We still walk around in sin. We still walk around with guilt. We still walk around with shame. And we feel like maybe even though we've given our life to God, to Christ, and we really want to believe everything, it's like sometimes we feel like we're still trapped in this darkness. And this says you need to throw off your sinful nature, which is corrupted by lust and deception, and instead let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. So the scripture is true that the old has gone and the new has come, but the new is coming. It's a process. You are in process of being made new. And so it's instantaneous in that, yes, that old is gone, but we have to learn to walk in the new. And this, the scripture helps us to walk in the new. And then it keeps going. It it says, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Put on your new nature. There's another scripture. It's Romans chapter 12. uh, In the first couple of verses, it says this, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so that putting on a new nature is identifying, conforming to the world, and being transformed by the Spirit of God. There is a process at work in your life. And so the scripture right here, if we break it down, it's the Holy Spirit is alive and well, and He is speaking to us, and He does speak to us. And so if we approach the scriptures as being useful to teach us, then what will happen is we should see here that there should be a struggle within us. So if you've ever If you've ever felt that struggle, then great, you are right on track. If you have felt like, I really want to do better at life, I really want to please Jesus, I know that what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm not exactly sure how to fix it, you're right on target. If you've given your life to Jesus and there is no struggle, 
you're still doing your own life, and you're like, yeah, I got Jesus, but there's nothing going on inside of you, can I say that you need to be cautious and you need to be careful? Because if the spirit of the living God is at work in you because you have given your life to Jesus, there should be a power struggle within you. From now until the day you die, there is a power struggle within you. You're learning how to live like Jesus while you're putting off your old nature. And so don't let the enemy tell you you're doing it wrong if you're experiencing struggle. It's good and it's right. And Jesus says it's going to happen. There is going to be a power struggle within you. And so you keep giving your life to Christ. You acknowledge it and you say, Father, help me to overcome this struggle. And then the next one will come and it's okay. But God will never give up. And so anyway, I need to say that. Okay, keep going. It says this. This is the one I'm kind of like, duh. Um, it says, instead, oh, stop telling lies. Yeah. Uh, let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. That's kind of common sense. Don't tell lies. I mean, when you're a kid, your parents tell you not to tell lies. Hopefully, by the time you reach like middle school, lying was disciplined out of you. Right? I remember being a kid and I would tell, I was something about playing in the bathroom. I wasn't supposed to play in the bathroom. And we would play in the bathroom. And then my mom would ask us, be like, no. Well, we got in trouble. We lied. So eventually I learned that lying is not worth it. You know, it's better just to tell the truth, face the consequences. Lying sucks, okay? So you, common sense, don't tell lies. Here's the thing. So I don't think any of us in here are liars. Probably we've grown out of that phase of life. But when I was reading this, it was like the Lord, uh, he did something. Because there's, it's almost like they're, they're smashed together. It says, stop telling lies. Tell your neighbors the truth. Um, and then don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't go to bed angry. It gives a foothold to the devil. And you know what the Lord did? I, I want to expose this in our life because I don't think any of us are liars. But how about this? And This mostly applies, I think, to people who really don't like conflict. You want to avoid conflict at all costs. Um, let's say you're asked to do something and you really don't want to do it but you don't want to deal with the conflict of saying no or the fight or the, the, it's not even a fight really, it's just a conversation, but you feel interrogated because you don't like conflict. And so if you say, no, I don't want to do that and there's a little bit of a pushback, you just give in, okay? If you haven't been honest and said no, first of all, if you didn't say no and so they don't know that you don't want to do it or you ended up just giving in and so you gave them permission or you said it was okay, here's the, here's the thing, maybe you've been there. Um, then you get mad <laughs> because you didn't want to do it in the first place, right? And you're not mad at yourself for not saying no. You're mad at the other person because they couldn't read your mind because they wouldn't just back off because you wanted to avoid conflict. Okay, okay, okay. It says, don't tell lies. Tell our neighbors the truth. Don't go to bed angry because it gives a foothold to the devil. That word foothold actually means a space in your heart, territory, land. You gave the devil permission to occupy a part of your heart. And so now what happens, you went to bed angry because you can't tell them because you're going to avoid conflict. And so you're still lying to yourself and to them, just not outwardly. It's a lie of omission, we'll call that. Okay? You go to bed angry, and then all of a sudden, it just it slowly builds up. There's like this weird resentment and harbored anger in your heart. And so now that relationship between you and that person or you and those people has been damaged. Not on their part on your part because you have given the enemy a foothold in your life to make bad, bad, poor choices towards that person. Whoa! I feel like that's really deep. I feel like that's really deep. And I feel like a lot of us have done that. Okay, and so this is, this is really cool. Scripture is useful, and the Lord used this scripture when I came across it. We're going to get there in a minute. I'll come back. I'm going to come back. We're going to keep moving. <laughs> Whew. Oh, I'll say this. Um... Scripture is being useful here in teaching us how to avoid being led by the enemy. That's really what it is. He's teaching, the scripture is teaching us how to avoid being led by the enemy and ruining relationships. You must speak up. You must tell the truth. You must face conflict. And then when you are angry, admit that you are angry and then work through it. Because if you don't, it's just damaging relationships. It's the enemy destroying people. 
okay? We're going to keep going. It says, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Duh. Instead, use your hands for good and hard work. And then give generously to others in need. Very simple. Do work. <laughs> Don't be idle. And then use what you earn to bless the people around you, okay? Uh, keep going. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. <gasps> Chances are you prefer to be around people who make you feel good by the way they talk. So here, scripture is being useful. If you want to be somebody who others like to be around, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good for building other people up. And then people will want to be around you. And then you'll get to share the love and the joy and the person of Jesus because people are in your presence. And then it keeps going. It says, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Think about what you do before you do it. Think about it. Uh, <laughs> kind of weird but would God really want to watch me do this or would God do this with me <laughs> because if he won't then don't do it hindsight is always 2020 you're like oh bad idea but here's the deal you can look back and say bad idea and then get better Okay, so the word of God is useful. You, and hindsight's 2020, that's fine. You recognize you made a poor choice, and then you move forward into better choices. That's okay. Use your past to propel you forward. Okay? Um, do not remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You will be wronged today um, and every day until the day you die. Someone's going to make you mad. You're going to have to forgive somebody today and every day until the day that you die. I promise you, it'll happen. Here's the other thing. You are going to wrong somebody today and every day until the day you die. And you're going to seek forgiveness from somebody else. And here's the thing. God says, forgive them just as Christ forgave you. Here's the deal. God predecided that he's not going to hold your sin against you. God predecided to forgive you when you ask for it. And so you can predecide to forgive somebody who hasn't even wronged you yet. You make a decision in your heart. You predecide, I will forgive no matter the cost. I know it will hurt. I know it's going to be painful. I know I'm not going to walk through it. I'm going to be damaged in the process. There are things, no matter what, I am predeciding to forgive because God has forgiven me. Make the decision beforehand. To pre you predecide to be forgiving. Okay, now as we move through that passage, I felt a little rubbed the wrong way by the th some of the things God said, like don't lie. <laughs> Are you calling me a liar? <laughs> Have you ever come to the scripture feeling like that? Like, hmm. Hmm. Here's if you experience that emotion when you're reading the word, Chances are there's something going on in your life that God wants to deal with. Remember, God uses scripture to teach us what is true, to make us realize when we are wrong, you lied, um, corrects us when we are wrong, you lied, okay, and then teaches us to do what's right. And so it is good to come to the scripture and to feel exposed. It is useful because if it can be highlighted, then it can be removed. And it can be removed, we can walk into everything that God has for us. The scripture is useful. And that's kind of what I was struggling with. It was like, I wanted you guys to feel good about coming to the Bible. I wanted you to be able to feel like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm kumbaya, I'm going to come to the Bible, I'm going to feel so good. That's just not true. That's not true. The, the word of God is useful because it corrects us when we are wrong. The car. We need to be disciplined, each and every one of us. I need to be told no. You need to be told no. We need boundaries in our life to function effectively. And that's what the word of God is. And it's not done harshly. And it's not done because God hates us. It's done because God loves us. He brings correction and discipline into our lives. And he teaches us how to live right. Um, chances are there are people in your life who you love and you look up to who love Jesus. And I think there, I know there's people like that in my life. And you know why I look up to them and I admire them so much is because they're letting the word of God transform them. They're coming to the Bible and they're realizing and recognizing and out loud stating that, yes, I have an old way of life. I absolutely have an old way of life. 
and I, and I know a way of doing things, but I am letting God transform me. I am being humble before God, and I am admitting when I am wrong. I am saying, yes, God, you are right. I was wrong, and being transformed. And those people I admire. Those people I look up to because I am seeing the living God at work in their life. That cannot be chained. That cannot be bound up. It doesn't matter where they go. If that person finds themselves in prison, and if they still love Jesus and they don't get mad about him for it, then they're going to bring people to prison, in prison to Christ Jesus, because it cannot be chained. That love for God cannot be chained. So when we come to the word of God, I want each and every single one of us to live a life that is unchained by the word of God through the power of the living God at work within us. I want you guys, the people of Lifeline, to be be known as people who are humble before God and letting the word of God transform you. So I want to pray now. That's that's it. We're going to pray. Close your eyes.